Hi, guys. Welcome to the How I Raised It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckard, and today's episode is with Sterling Pratts of Car IQ, a payment platform for fleet vehicles. We talk a lot about strategic investors in this one. Car IQ raised money from insurance company State Farm and gas station company Circle K and several others. And Sterling shares a lot of really good tips for dealing with strategics which is really kind of a different animal than venture capital. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, I've created a super valuable free welcome package for you. It includes a list of 2,500 investors who don't require a warm intro, plus 200 questions that investors are going to ask you. So it's really going to help you get ready to raise money. To get instant access to this, please click the link in the first comment. While you're there, please leave us a nice comment what you like about this episode or this show in general. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them and hit that subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Thank you. Now sit back and enjoy this chat with Sterling. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Sterling Pratts of Car IQ Pay coming to us from San Francisco. How's your day going? It's great. It's good. Great to be on here, Nathan. Look forward to catching up. It's been a long time. Yes, so this is a fun one. Sterling and I go way back. We uh, worked together for a bit on his last company, which was AutoNet Mobile. Maybe do you want to give just a a quick one minute summation of the AutoNet story? What was AutoNet and what was the outcome of AutoNet? Yeah, it's one of the coolest things I've done in a long time since auto racing. And that was, we were the first ones who put internet in the car. Started with Wi-Fi in the car, became an in-dash experience. And eventually, if uh, you could use your phone to uh, control your car, start it, stop it, roll windows up and down, that type of thing. Um, and we had some really big customers. And, you know, at the time, the Valley said, you'll never get an auto OEM. And my vision was, man, it really sucks to deal with the car industry because you have to wait three model years to get some update like um, like Bluetooth in your car at the time. And keep in mind, this started this before uh, before the iPhone came out one year. But um, and when we were done, we had five OEMs. And I think that was really a big win for us. You know, we learned how to raise money. We went through the crash of 2008 and nine. Uh, we came out a better company. And then on top of that, uh, we had five OEM deals that where now we were the Uconnect system inside a uh, Fiat Chrysler, which is now Stellantis. We were inside a Nissan Infiniti with deals. We were working with GM. And so it was really a great experience. And and what was the ultimate outcome? I don't even know, actually. What Was AutoNet acquired or did... Um... Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, it was definitely tough coming out of the, you know, the economy crash, especially because our two biggest customers went Chapter 11, and that was Chrysler and General Motors. Um, and we were really ramping. Um, that was the hardest part about the whole thing. And then the world stopped. Um, and then we built it back up. Um, I think that was one of the most important things is as the economy crashed, we sort of pivoted, um, had to definitely go through some hard times. There was no question about that. Um, but we came out as a better company. And then we went back at Chrysler. We signed a new deal, it became the Chrysler. You connect the, the phone app that you saw. We launched with the Dodge Dart in 2012. Uh, and then we sold the company in 2015 to Lear. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So just... I don't want to spend too much time on AutoNex. I want to get to your new startup, but a couple of favorite mm-hmm. memories. One is I had one of the early prototype wireless routers. I remember driving from California to my parents' house in Colorado with my wife and brother and dog. And we had this thing. It didn't work the whole way, but you know, it worked much of the way. It was like having internet in the car before basically anyone else on this planet had internet in the car. That was really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other, other fun memory I still have of those days uh, when we were, you know, working together to raise money was having meetings in um, Tom, I'm forgetting his last name. The, Tom the, Price. Yeah. Tom Price, his, yeah. his car collection garage, which, you know, how many cars does he have? I mean, there were all these incredible Ferraris, Lamborghinis, Aston Martins, and having pitch meetings there was so much cool. It was so fun, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, it was, um, remember, that was fun times. I mean, he had a uh, the most amazing vintage car collection anyone could ever see. I think right now, I think Tom's probably one of the top two or third, second or third rather uh, prominent car collector in the world. And 
you're right. There was Aston Martins and Ferraris. Remember the GT250? Um, was the drummer of Pink Floyd? Um, it was his car that Tom had just bought from him. So yeah, it was a it's pretty fun. That uh, was just a cool place to be, sort of incubating, hatching, pitching a car related startup. You know, <laughs> was, yeah, was yeah, so absolutely. Those were definitely good times. And Tom has been a great supporter and absolutely wonderful person. So you know, always really. You know, always actually really value that experience because that's important. You know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're growing, it's the people you meet along the way that can help you grow the company, but they also help you learn and become a better, you know, better business person. And and Tom, Tom was definitely one of those. Yeah, and and then let's move on. But for anyone not familiar, Tom Price is um has car dealers here in in the Bay Area and you know pretty well known. So there's the connection there. Let's um let's go to your new startup. So what yeah. do you guys do at Car IQ Pay? Yeah, so we uh, sort of 2.0 thinking. You know, the first one was how do we get internet in the car and how do we develop apps that can help you um, control that car, either in-dash experiences or in-phone experiences. And there was something I kind of learned. You know, when we were in the testing labs and sitting on the brain of the car, um, I recognized all this unique data in the vehicle. And I felt like the future would be, hey, now we've, Now we've learned how to communicate with the phone and connect the phone and the car together. But my 2.0 thinking was a little bit different. Um, I really understood payments, the financial sector space. And I really felt like the the big missing thing in automotive was was actually adding some sort of payment mechanism to the vehicle. And people were trying it. You know, there's in-dash experiences and you'd put your credit card in and all that. And it was really clunky and took like five or six steps. And what you realized out of it was, hey, it is cool to attach your car to things like, say, fuel pumps or parking meters or uh, tolling stations. You know, I really hated having a box in my car. You know, you remember I had that really nice BMW and it just killed me to have this box about that big sitting in my windshield um, so I could go over the bridge. And my thought was, what if the car could just communicate directly with the merchant and transact and you don't need to have a credit card or have a box in your car or anything like that? And I just started taking that thinking to the next level. And so about a year and a half, almost yeah, about a year and a half after uh, after AutoNet was sold, I decided I want to go for it. And I wanted to create a payment network for cars. Um, so I got together with, uh, with a friend of mine and we created an early working prototype. And uh, we were able to connect cars to like a, um, to mobile gas stations, you know, the guys who had the trucks that come to you. Um, and what we figured out was actually something even more interesting. My whole mantra was why I did it. Um, so kind of to your title of the of the thing was, I really believe cars are driving around looking for things to pay. And it was a really big market. And I felt the experience, but it was too clunky. So I wanted to find a better way to pay. Um, and I really was focused on the credit card. Like, man, I couldn't wait to get rid of a credit card in that process or that box in the car, which, by the way, is attached to a credit card. And in the process, what I realized actually was it wasn't the credit card that I was going after. It's the fact that banks and merchants don't trust cars to transact. And I started to look at that much differently and said, well, what other types of machines are, is this relevant to? And what I realized was there are hundreds of millions of IoT machines actually connected to the cloud asking for service or communicating in some service way. But none of them were paying without using a credit card because there was no way to trust the machine. And so I shifted my vision a little bit. Uh, some would argue that I pivoted You know, I don't know if that's good or bad, Um, but what it really was, I realized the card wasn't my problem. It was identity was my problem. And I figured out that if I could create a unique ID within the vehicle or any IoT machine, a bank or a merchant could trust it to transact. And that became Car IQ Pay is really what happened. And so, yeah, and that that became the start of, uh, of the company. And so what, I guess, what are the core one or two, two or three use cases today for, uh, for, for the system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, so as soon as you are able to connect the car, you know, so we looked at data, the first use case was how do you leverage the unique data in the vehicle to create a unique ID that a bank will use to, for trust? So that means now the car can connect directly to a bank account. And then how does the bank or how does the merchant rather connect directly to the vehicle so they can turn on a pump or activate a toll or a parking station, right? So those are the first applications was use the data to allow those guys to say it's okay. Uh, The second thing was how you apply it. So suddenly the world changed. 
it was no longer like, can I get rid of the credit card and able to pay? It was like, hey, there are five major things out there that cars pay for today. And it's a massive market. When when cars are driving around looking for things to pay, they're paying for fuel, you know, EV charging, tolling, parking, insurance, and then service and repair. That's kind of like in my world, the big five. And that market represents like $600 billion a year in the US alone. The cars are already doing today. And another 600 billion roughly in Europe and about the same in the Asia Pacific market and about half as much in South America. So the world market's almost $2 trillion. And that exists today. Um, and that that also became sort of the motivator to start Car IQ Pay. Okay. So automating all those big five and, and probably some future ones we haven't thought about yet. Um, but the website goes into fleet management. I guess that's um, uh, probably a pretty solid use case because you've got all these drive. I mean, maybe talk about that. Talk about the fleet yeah. management kit. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of like our starter kit, right? It, it's, you know, we had to find, we're an early stage company and had to find a market where we could prove product market fit. Um, we're an early stage company. So we also had to find something with a low cost of entry. Um, I think that's important in the entrepreneurship of starting a company. And what we recognized was the fleet space was really important. Um, the fleet vehicles by nature are already connected. They have a fleet platform. Um, there's already millions of them driving around the U.S. consuming fuel, toll, parking, insurance, and service and repair. Um, and so we decided, let's go call on a few of them and see what they think. And very quickly, we learned the fleet market likes this thing. That to a fleet operator, they already have seven or 10 credit cards they're using to pay for those five categories, right? And it's really difficult for them to manage all their expenses. So very quickly, we found a market fit for us. Um, and we also figured out that we need a partner. So we also talked to Citibank and Citibank really liked it. Um, the CIO of Citibank uh, personally got involved and they incubated us. And that really helped us not only refine our financial platform and the fintech side of our business, but it also helped us understand what's the right way to approach that market. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, cool. Let's, I want to get into the fundraising because that's really what this show is about. But um, where does this kind of go from here? Like if you look in the crystal ball five, 10 years ago, what, you know, I hear a lot of stuff about mm -hmm. the car almost being less about the car and the motor and everything else. And it's, you know, now a technology platform, of course. There's rumors of Apple getting into it and all this stuff. So here's my question. Fast forward five, 10 years, where do you see uh, your company and, and what role are you playing and what's going on with the car and <laughs> intelligence? Go. Five or 10 years from now? Sure. Um, I think it's all IoT machines. So I think cars are just the starting point for us. You know, we, we're obviously out going after fleets. We've signed up some really large companies right now as partners and we're scaling. Next will be auto OEMs. We're now starting to get auto OEM deals. And we think auto OEMs will take us consumer market. Um, so in dash experiences, for instance. Um, but I think very quickly after that comes smart cities. So we think smart cities are just another merchant. Um, like the city of San Francisco, every time a car double parks, they lose money. Right. But what if the city of San Francisco could communicate and work a deal out directly with a fleet? and say, look, we'll give you some sort of preferred pricing or flow, flow traffic pricing. Now they're generating money on every single fleet vehicle moving around their, the city. And it's not, a, it's not a tax, right? Taxes are kind of important, but they're kind of stupid too, right? Because they're, they're, they're only hitting you on the assumption that you're doing something with them. But in this case, it's much differently. The city could reach out to a large fleet and say, look, every time you double park, it's only going to cost you a buck instead of the $30 or the $100 fine we're gonna give you when, when that parking ticket shows up. Um, hey, every time your car comes into the city of San Francisco, we can charge you 10 cents for that car coming in for in egress or outgress um, and, and develop a more personal relationship with them. And it's beneficial to the fleet to do that because they can save on parking tickets and overhead and all that. Maybe they get preferred areas of parking and all that. Um, but the city now can have a more consistent view of who's coming into the city and then where it goes. And then I think third becomes smart homes. Like, why not just add your utilities to your bank account? I mean, ultimately, that's what this is about, Nathan. So we see kind of like that's where it goes in 10 years. Okay, cool. So let's talk about raising capital. How many rounds have you guys done? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, how much in total? Oh, that's the fun part, right? Um, you know, I think back to when you and I first worked together, you know, the beginning of AutoNet, it was... It was you went to Sand Hill Road and everything happened there, right? Now it's much different. Um, 
we've now raised, uh, we're, we just closed our B round in December of 2022. So just a few months ago, yeah, um, we, the, the round is really driven by visa. Um, so we progressed from sort of the venture and strategic market now moving up, up, upstream to visa. Um, they've been amazing partners to work with. Um, Forte Ventures came in to lead the round alongside them. Uh, and then we've also had some other great uh, investors come in as well. Circle K came in because they saw not only can a product like ours drive volume to the pump, but if they have access to the data in the car, they could also send offers and rewards to that to that vehicle while it's sitting at the pump and move them into the C-Store. So they invested. Um, State Farm came in. Um, they really see the ability to communicate directly with with the driver for you know driver deals and, and offers and things for behavioral aspect. Um, so we've seen some really good ones. Avanta came in, which is CSA, AAA. Um, and they've been a great investor as well. And they're local, um, by the way. So that really started to comprise the B round for us. Yeah, cool. That's great. What about, um, I want to come back to this, but talk about the early days. Did you raise an angel round? What was, uh, you know, give me almost the chronology of of the oh, round. Oh, yeah. If we go on that, yeah, we raised, um, so we built an early working product, which is important today. Um, you know, the market's kind of changed. Like when you and I went and raised money, it was kind of like, you, you know, how it is you built a deck, you went out and raised a seed round. Um, it could be a concept. And then you went to your, you know, traditional A round where you built an early working product, proved market fit and then scaled. Um, now it's much different. So we built a, we built an early working product and we raised a seed round. Um, everything shifted to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, did you self-finance the the prototype or the, the working yeah. product? And then, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My partner and I did. Um, and then we did that. We raised a seed round. Uh, Ecosystem Ventures came into the round, um, really helped us with that seed. So Alex Fries was awesome. And by the way, there's a great example of being good to your investors because Alex had invested in Autonet. Yeah. Um, he really enjoyed the ride. It was a good experience for him. He made some money on it. And so he took a flyer on this one. He, he liked what we were doing, believed in the market. Um, and then we quickly after that, we we won the plug and play award uh, in 2018. And we we went and raised a little bit more seed money. And also we started our A round in 2019. Um, so we did an A round that was six million. Yeah, um, we use that to go get our first customers on, you know, um, scale up the product. Uh, we signed Discover card, which was a big deal. Um, so Discover is one of our big customers now. Um, and then, uh, we use that to start, um, well, we really use it to start scaling, but we wanted to become an issuing bank. So we still had a little bit more work to do. So we put customers on the same time we started going through banking and regulatory. So we ran those in parallel and then we completed banking and regulatory. Um, so we can become an issuing, uh, an issuing bank. And, um, and with that in place, we signed some really large customers and that drove our B round. So yeah. and that's that's what we just recently closed. What uh who led the A round? Uh uh Andy Ogawa at Quest Ventures. Um oh, yeah. he led the A round with us. Yeah, that was a great one. He saw the opportunity and knew we were like right at that precipice of going big. Um, so he jumped in at that time. And Citibank came in at that time, Royal Bank of Canada came in. Um, so we had some really good investors at that early stage. Did you go through plug and plays accelerator or uh or just do some competition or something they put on. Yeah, they have that, you know, where you've got to go demo for them and and do that. And then um and it worked out really well for us. Um Alareza over there really saw this as well. He saw this as going really big. Um so Alareza and, and Plug and Play got behind us personally as well. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Yes, some of my other favorite memories of the Autonet days, your previous startup. Every I was living in the city, you were living in Marin, and every day you would drive in pick me up, you'd hop out into the passenger seat so you could work on your laptop using Autonet. I would drive. I would drive us down to Sand Hill Road. Yeah. Do a couple pitches, recap after that, maybe get a beer, <laughs> depending on how good or bad those pitches went, and then repeat that same thing the next day. It was fun, though. I mean, it's definitely something. So, you know, maybe contrast that with raising in 2019, um, maybe the Series A, I guess. What was different or or surprising about that yeah. yeah there's actually a lot of fun stories either we could tell on a podcast or off but um life was different then right all the vcs were pretty much on sand hill road and you had the guys at the top like sequoia and kleiner and red who were in the you know two-story 
uh, buildings. And then you have the guys at the bottom who are up and coming venture capitalists right. um, who are in the four story buildings. And remember that whole game of, of just traveling up and down uh, Sand Hill Road. Um, also, there wasn't cell coverage all the way on Sand Hill Road at the time, which was kind of ironic. Um, but it's all changed now. Now, venture capital is everywhere. And it, it, and I think the pitch process has changed. So when you and I were doing it, we would have one deck, you know, 10 or 11 slides. Um, and we would go pitch our pitch our strategy, you know, and that included financials. Now it, it's completely different. Now what I learned, especially and I learned it from Al Areza at Plug and Play, um, he really was a genius and he he really took me under his wing and said, hey, here's how you should really adapt to the new world. And, the, and I look at it now as a three-step process. So the first thing you do is you build like three or four slides that are like a movie trailer. Um, and they just tell, they tell the story of your business, but from the customer experience perspective, like, hey, here's how cool it is. You know, we built this payment network for cars. It allows the car to communicate directly with any merchant and pay. Now you drive into a gas station, you just put the pump number in, it automatically turns it on, put gas in your car and you drive away. And that's it. That's your presentation. You can do it in four to six minutes. That's it. And if they like you, you come back and you pitch an eight to 10 slide deck, which is, hey, here's that experience and here's that market that we can go after. And here's some of the financials that we know will make us successful. And then if they really like that, you come back with more of a partner meeting. And that's the one where you get into a little bit more technical approach. Who else are you competing with? How does your technology work? Um, here are a deeper dive into our financials. Here are the competitors that you're really worried about. And, and now you put that farther down in your pitch presentation than say early on. So yeah. that's how I think it's changed. Um, and that really worked for us for raising money. It, it, it made it easier for the investor to digest what we're doing and really understand the big idea. But in that first pitch meeting, let me unpack that a little bit, you know, 33 to four slides, kind of the movie trailer from the user perspective. I like that idea a lot. Is that all you came with? And then kind of yeah. just, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I'd have extra if they wanted to dive in, like who's the mark, you know, who are your competitors or, you know, tell me who the merchants are. But no, it's always three to four slides, just simply a movie trailer. Like, here's what we do. So they know what box we fit in. Um, here's how cool it is. Here's how the customer now would use it. Um, here's why it's different than today's platform. So we'd say, hey, look, today fleets go in and pay for fuel, but they have to use a credit card. Then they have to put their PIN number in. They have to put their odometer in. It's really painful, right? In our case, they just simply drive in, uh, open up the pump, put gas in the car, and they drive away. And we surface all that data. And then here's how cool the data is that we surface prior to a transaction. That's it. And that would be enough to get people pretty excited about what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Were you still going, so this is 2019, so pre-COVID, mm -hmm. but were you still driving down to San, uh, Sand Hill Road every day or was we doing it all on Zoom? Like what was the actual, what other changes did you find? Yeah. Um, well, one is we were, we were incubated inside of Citibank. So several VCs came to us, which was really nice. And, and Citibank was awesome, all until I signed Discover. Then they said, hey, you know, it might be good if you get your own office space. Um, can't have banks running in here. But um, no, pretty, we went to Sand Hill Road occasionally, um, but not very often, actually. We, we actually spent more time at Plug and Play going down to Cupertino. Um, so it's a little bit longer drive. But, you know, they were great. They let us stay there and work in, you know, one of the cubes while we had meetings. And we would actually meet a lot of VCs or potential investors of some type um, at, at plug and play. And if it wasn't plug and play, you know, that was typically two days a week. Then I would just do Zoom Zoom, uh, um, Zoom calls with VCs from anywhere around the country. Yeah, yeah. And how are you figuring out, because you're kind of fintech, you're kind of automotive, you're straddling two worlds, um, It which one to go after and and. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard in the beginning. You know, um, you know, we did a lot of soul searching sometimes. What are we? Are we an automotive company? Are we a payments company? Are we a telematics company? And it was easy to get us confused because people would see all the data, for instance, we surface and go, oh, you're a telematics company. You're like, keep trucking or someone yeah. like that. And we'd say, no, 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 we're not. We're surfacing the data from the transaction and we're using that for payment service type capabilities. But we're not trying to make a better fleet. And, and we had to get better explaining that story. Um, and I think that's every entrepreneur's challenge, right? Is how do you succinctly tell your story so they know what box to put you in? If you don't do it right, what I learned 
is the the venture capitalist sitting across the table from you will spend all their time scanning what box do you fit in and they're going to miss the message or they're going to miss the importance of what you're doing and i felt the zoom world made that more important than ever when you're in person you have that interchange with someone you get that chemistry and sometimes it's easy for a vc to say hey time out back it up a step tell me what you do and then let's go again when you're in zoom it's not so easy anymore um, and you've got to really change your, your you've got to be more tone sensitive uh, than you are if you're in person. So would you just simply tailor the pitch a little bit each time, depending on whether you're talking to a, a fintech yeah. investor versus an automotive investor, or did you just kind of focus on fintech or what? I focused on the fintech, but did have something that was a value to that category. So if I was talking to an insurance company, by the way, you know, we have insurance, so CSA, AAA, plus State Farm in the company. We always had something that said, hey, this is where we think it can be applied to your category. You know, we simply want cars to pay for insurance, whether it's UBI, um, whether it's just a monthly payment, um, whether it's pay per mile, it doesn't really matter to us. We want to surface the data from the vehicle so you could build better actuary models. But at the same time, we just simply want that car to pay its insurance bill. Um and, and that was a great start for us. Um, and the same could be said for like, you know, look at Visa. They invested in us. And Visa was very similar. Like, hey, we want to have all our payment volume. We want payment volume going over Visa's network. Uh, we want to surface data so that we can look at a payment much differently for prevent fraud, to prevent friendly fraud, um, to enable the merchant to communicate differently with maybe the customer or Visa themselves or a bank. So we did adapt quite a bit. Kind of riffing on this a little bit more, I won't keep it too much longer, but, uh, you know, a lot of the investors in this most recent round were strategic investors like Visa, mm -hmm. Circle K, State Farm. First of all, I guess, what was the logic behind that? And I, I guess the second part of that is I can imagine when you're pitching State Farm, you're telling how you can help State Farm, how it's relevant, you know, to that strategic, but that might be different than what Circle K needs, right? I mean, so each one... I can see myself getting caught in a, a thing of making promises to all my strategic partners that yeah. now pulls the company in five different directions. So go. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, honestly, Nathan, where were you if, uh, when we were first starting this one? Um, that's part of the learning curve, right? You have to make sure that we were focused. And we did. We came in and made sure that we didn't sound like we're another insurance company or another uh, competitor. What we What we did is we said, this is how payments can make your business better. But we also had to listen and determine where do payments fit into their organization. And, and honestly, some other insurance companies looked at us and they didn't really get it. They, they kind of got it, but I think they weren't ready for it. But then there were a few that said, absolutely, we get where this fits. We get that we can trade vehicle data for insurance policies and that benefits us. And, and State Farm, as an example, or CSA AAA through Avanta saw that too. Um, and they jumped on. And, and I think the greater question, though, is what you're really bringing up is why more strategics than venture capitalists? And it wasn't it wasn't originally by design, but it very quickly became a design. And that was because the strategics are already feeling the pain. They already know the challenges they're facing in the market, and they're trying harder to make their business better and expand it. And so when we start talking to strategics, they typically get it right away. They'd be, oh, yeah, this is how payments would make our business better. Go talk to this person. Um, or they might even have a division already thinking about it and trying to figure it out and saying, we haven't seen anything like Car IQ before. Let's work with these guys. Whereas the venture capitalists are one step removed. They're looking at categories and they're saying, is payments a thing? Yes. Are cars paying for things a thing? Maybe. Convince me why that market's going to be big and why there's pain because they don't know what the strategics are feeling. And so you got that gap. And, and that's why I like strategics. And we learn from them, to be honest. Our strategics, knock on wood, have been awesome partners. Every single one of them has taken the time to give me insight of A, how to make my business better, but B, how to apply it directly to their challenges in, the, in that market segment. And that's helped us. But I guess, how do you balance that with, you know, having, again, like five different or multiple different strategics each how do you prevent it from pulling your company, the gravity of the insurance world or the gravity, gravitational pull of Circle K world? How do you keep it from pulling you and just being a, a vendor for 
for insurance. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, how do you balance? No, I, I, I think actually you're hitting on the heart of the problem, right? So in the beginning, we wanted to be all things to all people. So because we, we knew our customers wanted it. And then what we learned is the, the strategics weren't always ready to get this moving, but they wanted to get, you know, to start learning. So what we did is we switched. Instead of trying to encourage our strategics to move faster, we let our customers tell us which products they wanted sooner than later and prioritize them. And then we brought that back to our strategics. And that has really helped us. So today, for instance, our customers say, I really want to work with the fuel guys. I really want to have the number one thing we're getting requests for today is I re- they, the the fuel merchants want to have access to the vehicle data prior to it transacting. And they want to do it for two reasons. They want to know who this customer is and they want to know if they can send them an offer. Like, hey, when was the last time this car shopped with us? When was the last time it shopped at one of our other stations? When was the last time it shopped with a competitor? Um, how many miles were on the car when it came into my gas station? How big is its gas tank? Uh, how many uh, gallons are in that gas tank? And that information to them prior to the transaction is important because A, they know who the customer is, B, they know the risk of the transaction prior to it happening, right? Really important information. Now the, the Circle Ks of the world are saying, hey, I really want to learn how can I use that information to send that driver a personalized offer so that while they're sitting there at the pump, they can go into my C-store and buy a coffee, a roller dog, windshield wipers, whatever it might be. Um, By the way, I didn't know what roller dogs were in all my years of auto racing. I never knew that's what they called them. I just knew I didn't like those things. Um, But it was really funny. But, um, But that's why. So there's a great example of working with your strategic and figuring out where the priorities are. Um, so, and I feel like that's why Circle K has been a wonderful investor because they've opened up our ability to work with the merchant much differently than if we hadn't had that relationship. Yeah, it's good. Any other tips? Cause this is kind of an interesting topic that we haven't had mm-hmm. too much on this show about strategics. Any other tips either for landing or pitching strategic investors or, you know, things to be careful of when dealing with strategics, any other advice about strategic investors? I think, um, I think you got to find the right person in the in the strategic. So typically, you know, since we're on this call, we're obviously talking about entrepreneurs raising money. I think you got to find their venture arm and, and talk to their venture arm. I think, two, you have to make sure you're um, aligned with the challenges or the areas they want to grow. So growth is really important to a strategic, not just fix a problem. But it depends on what you're offering, right? Um, I think those are two really important things. And I think the third is be focused when you talk to a strategic. They're trying to solve their problem. So stay li- aligned with their business. Don't, don't try to boil the ocean. Focus on them. Let them dive in deeply. Let them understand how this helps them with their, with their company. And let them come along on their own terms. Don't try to force them. Um, I think that's important. I do think, to your point about the challenge, though, there's something every entrepreneur should know. When you deal with strategics, sometimes some of them are trying to just learn. Mm. And in the venture world, that's okay, because sometimes VCs are learning about categories and channels. Totally fine. But in the in the in the strategic world, they might be doing it to create their own product, or they might be doing it to figure out how it fits their business and who else they should work for, which is totally fair. But so you've got to understand are they in it because they want to really work with you, or are they in it because they want to learn? And and both are fine. You just as an entrepreneur, you should understand that a little better or be sensitive to it. How do you determine their interest i mean i guess just ask or what just ask them yeah Yeah. i find strategics to be incredibly open and very good to work with you just simply need to ask them like what's your interest level how do you want to go about this Um, what information can i provide that will help you with your business decision and by the way i have i can't say who it is i did have one major strategic who came in saying i just want to learn about the market and when i asked them the question they said well we may build our own we may just put a credit card in the dash um, or we may use you we don't know. And so their openness encouraged me to just be open with them. And lo and behold, they became an investor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so always treat them with the intention that they could be an investor, because my opinion is they will, if they're opening up the chat with you, there is some interest, right? And are you any last to- question on this topic, but any, um, caveats around like if you're working with visa or visas investing in you are you prohibited from working with american express or 
whoever else, you know, any like limitations? No, on, on the visa investment side, the, uh, visa is investing in us to go big. So that's that's as much as I can say right now. Um, you know, they, they're looking at us as a strategic investment. They want us to scale and go big. They want to see machine payments uh, become the standard for the industry. But they also really believe in our identity verification capability, like our ability for a machine to validate itself. Um, so they're telling us, go focus on that and build a big business. Do you have to actually explicitly state like, and, and I'm just using like Circle K as an example, that, hey, you're not limited, you know, you're still allowed to go work with 7-Eleven or myriad of other chains. Like, do you no. kind of work that into the term sheet at all or anything like that? No, no, you don't. You know, look, it, I think the bigger story here is, you know, is someone just basically buying you from an investment perspective, buying your channel? And the answer is no. Um, I, I, I actually think most strategics are really good about that. They, If they're investing in you, they don't want to lock you up because um, they know if they lock you up, that limits their ability to make money on your success in the future. Um, it may cripple you in the market. So I don't find that to be a challenge. Um, and we actually haven't had any of our strategic say from the investor side, say you can't do something. Um, Interesting. There's not exclusivity in in their term sheet, anything you know, like that in, in terms of who you can work with, stuff like that. No, they tend to be very good about, you know, um, um, not only not putting um, a bear hug on you, but they also are very good about not asking for confidential information from competitors. So there's definitely a wall there, um, which I really re respect. It makes my job easier, like at a board meeting level or when I'm reporting to the investment community what's happening. Um, they're not going to pry in and ask about competitors or things like that. All right. My my last question, when I ask of everyone, but um, if you could go back in time and give your younger self, uh, you know, some advice, what would that be? Or, or any other just general advice you'd like to share with entrepreneurs? Anything? Um, you know, I, I think I think the thing I would share with entrepreneurs is um, focus on your, don't oversell your business. When you're talking to VCs, in today's world, just let them know what you're doing. And it's okay if that's not a category they're interested in, um, but you might learn from it. So the first thing is, is just be a little bit more open about your business and why you like it. Um, but just present it to them in a more casual format um, to know your business really well, like know who your competitors are, know why it's a big market. Um, why are you going after it? Don't. My feeling is a lot of VC or a lot of not VCs, but a lot of entrepreneurs focus too much on what they're building and not enough on wh why they're building it. And there's a subtle difference there, right? Why I'm building it is I want to create a really cool payment experience. I want to have a a car simply go in and, and communicate directly with the fuel pump and transact because it's safer, easier to use. It's, you know, there's no fraud um, versus I want to build identity verification so that everybody can share data, right? That is that is part of what we do, but that's not what's interesting to someone. Um, so don't be afraid to talk about the things that make you passionate about why you're doing it and then talk about what you can do with it and then talk about why you built it. And and that order, I think, is really important for an entrepreneur to embrace. Yeah, that's good. Very good. If people want to learn more, it's um, GoCarIQ, right? What's the mm -hmm. URL? Sorry, I had it written down. No, I can't. Yeah, go GoCarIQ.com. GoCarIQ, great. Anything you want to plug or promote? Any open jobs or anything at all you want to kind of give a shout out about? Um, right now we're good. Um, we have a, we, we actually just had a major hire. Our CTO came from Apple pay, which was really cool. Um, so we're really bringing in domain expertise and we are opening up a position right now for, as a CRO. So we now have big customers and a huge pipeline and we're, we're really trying to level up and bring a CRO in to help us scale our business. So if anybody knows anybody in that space, we're definitely open and I'd definitely love to chat with them. How should people reach you? Is it, uh, you don't have to give your email if you don't want to, but just point them in the right direction. Yeah. 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 Just, uh, they can just email me personally, sterling at gocariq.com. Yeah. Got it. Excellent. All right, Sterling. Well, thank you, sir. And hopefully we'll get out on the dirt bike trails before, before too long here and, uh, tear it up a bit. <laughs> yeah. A little throttle therapy will be good for you, Nathan. We'll have some fun. Absolutely. I've been, uh, this, 
poor motorcycle has been sitting there in the rain for the past two months, just collecting rust. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you got to get it out there. Yeah. Time for that. All right. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Thank you, Sheriff, for setting it up. And uh, we'll uh, catch you after your next round, whatever that yeah. may be. Thanks, Nathan. Look forward to it. Over now.